Hey, man, can you believe we're just a few hours away from Christmas? That is awesome, man. It's awesome for so many reasons. Let me tell you one of the reasons it's awesome. Is my kids going to stop asking me, like, hey, when's Christmas coming? Because when my kids say, like, how many more days till Christmas, you know what they're really saying, right? Dad, when do we get to open the presents? Well, I think that that's something that even in ancient Israel, they were feeling some 2,000 years ago. You see, they were absolutely desperate for a Messiah. Like they wanted him to come sooner rather than later. That he was coming, and they're probably all asking themselves like, hey, is the day today, is the day today, like is this going to happen today? When's the Messiah going to come? Because they were just desperate for Jesus. And that's a theme that runs through for all of our lives today is, man, we're desperate for Jesus, whether we know it or not. And so this morning, I thought what I would do is I thought what we'd do together is we would just kind of walk through history a little bit and, uh, and connect some of the dots in history that revealed the mystery of the Messiah coming. And here's what we're going to see over the next few minutes together that will just be plainly clear, it will be unmistakable, is what we're going to get to see is that God is in the details. And the details, all the details are going to point back to this one thing. And this is, here's the one thing. To celebrate Christmas is to celebrate the purpose of why Jesus came. Like, why do we celebrate Christmas? Yeah, God sent his son Jesus. But man, it's why Jesus came that we really get to celebrate because Jesus sacrificed his life for ours. He paid our debt. Why? So that each and every one of us could know the beauty of what Jesus already knew. To have a personal relationship with the God of the universe. So do I think Christmas is awesome? Man, I think it's really awesome. But the reason I think it's really awesome is the reason why Jesus came. So that we could know God. So let's uh, start our time off together and connect some of the cool dots in history that will reveal the mystery of the Messiah coming. And we'll start with a familiar person. If you've been with us at any, uh, for any weeks prior to this, you know that we've been studying the life of a guy named David. And so we're going to start with David's life. And just, um, just to see how, how, how I did, we were doing run-through this week. And uh, some of the people in the room, I, just, I asked the same question that I'm about to ask you. And I said, and so I asked, and when I asked the question, they said, I have no earthly idea. And I said, I failed miserably. I just failed miserably. All right, here we go. So here's the question. Let's see if you guys get it. Where, what is the name of the town that David grew up in? Bethlehem. All right, man, there it is. Okay, that's correct, man. David grew up in Bethlehem, and David's going to become king in some 1,000 years before the birth of Christ. 1,000 years before Christ came, God makes David a promise. And you can read about this, like you should read about it, uh, because it's a part that we didn't cover in the life of David, but it's found in 2 Samuel chapter 11 or sorry, 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 11 through 16, but God makes David a promise that the kingdom, his kingdom will continue to go on, that God will establish a ruler on the throne that will rule forevermore. And all the way back, a thousand years, 1,000 years before the birth of Christ, God begins to foreshadow the coming of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Because from the line of David will come the one who will rule forever, who will bring peace, and his name is Jesus. 500 years after that promise, and yet 500 years before Jesus, God taps a prophet named Micah on the shoulders, and he, wa he, he wants him to prophesy about where the Messiah will be born. And we see God once again revealing some details about the coming of Jesus Christ. Why? Because God is always in the details. And we see in Micah 5.2, it should be coming up on the screen. This is what Micah prophesies. But you, Bethlehem, but you, Bethlehem Ephratah, through you, 
or sorry, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old and are from ancient of days. 500 years after the promise to David, 500 years before Christ come, Micah prophesies where Jesus Christ is going to be born. If you fast forward 499 years from that moment, we're introduced to an unsuspecting person in history. And yet this unsuspecting person, God has a divine plan for her life. We know her as Mary. If you would, with, if you would I wanna read this together. If you would, if you would turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter one, verse 26. If you guys, you guys can open up your smartphones, you can turn on your tablets, go to version, open up your Bible. I'll give you a quick second to get there. And let me just tell you a detail about, well, I'll read this and then I'll tell you a cool, de- a de- a cool de- uh I will be able to talk, I promise. You just get me. Dude, didn't that, who, that sounded like Elmer Fudd to me for a minute. That is awesome. I'm gonna go home and practice that today. Okay, cool. All right. Mike, just read the words, buddy. Here we go. Luke chapter one, verse 26, in the six months, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of who? Oh, God's just connecting the dots, isn't he? The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Now Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, don't be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Now you're going to be with child and give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and he will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him a throne of his father David and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. See, God had already talked about this over a thousand years prior, and he's just sharing with Mary the details. And then Mary asks a really honest and really good question. How's this going to happen, Mary asked. I'm a virgin. The angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. And then if you'll skip down to verse 38, because I love this. this is, and, and again, we, we've talked about this before. We could do a whole message just on this one piece. But look at her response to God's plan and God's will for her life. She just says, may it be to, may it be to me as you have said. God, when it comes to the plans that you have for my life, even though I don't understand them, even though they're a little bit confusing, may it be to me as you have said. I can't help but think of Jesus' words in the Garden of Gethsemane, hours before he was, he was to be betrayed. He said, not my will, but your will be done. Isn't that the proper posture before God? Isn't that the proper response, Lord? May it be to me as you've said. And to just trust and rest in his plans because he's working out the details. Last night I didn't share this, but I thought this morning I would share this with you because it's just another cool detail in the whole connecting the dots in the mystery of Jesus. You see, we know Mary in the English language, her name is Mary, but actually she was named, uh, her name was Miriam. Now, if you think about Miriam, you go all the way back into the Old Testament to the book of Exodus, and we we find a young woman named Miriam, and she was Moses' sister. Miriam in Egypt, in Egyptian language, means love. Savior's going to be born through Mary. God is love. But Miriam in Hebrew means something completely different different. It means bitterness. It means rebellion. So when we look at just the meaning of the name Mary, if we look at just one of the details, salvation comes through bitterness and rebellion. I mean, you think about how you came to Christ. We were sinful. We were rebellious. And salvation came to liberate us. Just some of the beautiful details in this whole birth, the coming of the Messiah, that are there for us in scriptures to find, and 
all of them, all of them are going to point back to the reason for which Christ came. Even so far, even so far is the name Bethlehem. But before I get there, I just want to ask a question because this is where things get really interesting for me. We just read in Luke chapter 1 where Mary was living when, angel, when the angel Gabriel came to visit her. Where was she living? Now this is where you got to talk back to me. This is where I make sure I haven't put you out yet. This is awesome stuff. Like, listen, I grew up, I, I couldn't stand details. Details freak me out. But details are awesome, especially when God's in those details. They're awesome. So I'm going to ask one more time. You can go back and you can read. Check it out. Feel free to crack that Bible open. Might hear a few creaks. Like, oh, there it was. It was open. All right, anyway. Where was Jesus living when the angel Gabriel? Nazareth in Galilee. Did you know that Nazareth in Galilee is some 90 miles away from Bethlehem? And see, this is going to be where things get super interesting. Not the fact that the announcement wasn't interesting enough, but somehow God is going to have to convince or get Mary from Nazareth to Galilee. How on earth is he going to do that? Because you saw in Micah 5.2, 500 years after David's promise, 500 years before Christ was born, God said that the Messiah was going to be born where? Bethlehem. So he's got to somehow get Mary from Nazareth to Bethlehem without just saying, you need to go there. How on earth is he going to do that? This is where things get interesting. This is where things get exciting and fun because here's what I want to tell you. So what I want to tell you is that God is willing to work through the natural order of historical events to accomplish his plans and his purposes. He's going to let us make our decisions. But behind all these decisions on the surface, behind all these, all these choices that are being made, God is in the details. He's going to work behind the scenes to accomplish his plans and his purpose. So how did he get Mary and Joseph from here to there? A census. That's going to freak somebody out. I'm going to say it anyway. On the surface, it looked like a government decision. But God was working through the details of a decision the government made to accomplish his plans and purpose. Whole oh, baby. Man, you look all throughout history, and what do you see? You see God working through governments to accomplish his plans and purposes. Again, if you just go back all throughout scriptures, I mean, we could go on and on and on, and I won't and I won't and I won't, but I'm gonna highlight a couple of them. I mean, if you go again back to the book of Exodus, you have this ruler, you have this powerful kingdom. Powerful kingdom's name is Egypt. The ruler sitting in office, his name is Pharaoh. And the, uh, the Israelites are living in the land of Egypt and they've grown to such a number that this Pharaoh's freaked out and so he decides to enslave them. He makes a choice to put these people into slavery. They cry out to God. God raises up a leader named Moses. But the whole deal is it looks on the outset like, hey, you've got these people who are slaves, but God is working behind the details of this government decision. And what is he gonna do? He's going to reveal himself through these events. He's going to reveal his power through these events. He's going to establish the nation for which Jesus came behind these events. I'm here to tell you something. God is always in the details and he's willing to work through decisions that appear normal in the natural course of history to accomplish his plans and purposes. Man, if you were to fast forward, I'll just hit, I'll highlight one more. Israelites, what are they? They're in captivity again and they're in captivity in a place called Babylon, the most powerful empire on the planet. And the king's name, his name is Nebuchadnezzar. And he's so full of himself that he actually has a statue that is made in his likeness. It's really, really tall. And he gathers everybody together that day. And he says, hey, all right, everybody got this great idea. Because I'm so awesome, I brought a band with me today. And when they start to play the music, everybody's gonna bow down and worship the statue that looks like me. And they're like, okay. And they're like, hey, just so that we're clear, if you don't do this, I've got this furnace over here and it's really hot. And if you don't bow down, I'm gonna throw you in that thing. Okay, all right, I think we're clear. All right, band, fire up the tunes. Can you name that tune? And they fire it up and every boom, down they go, except for three guys. 
So here you have this ruler who is really full of himself, doesn't even know that he's in power because of God's goodness, doesn't even acknowledge God, and yet three guys who dare acknowledge God don't bow down. They're ordered into the furnace. As they're thrown in the furnace, the guy who's full of himself looks. He goes, how many people we just throw in there? Three. And somebody tell me, where'd the fourth guy come from? And how come they're walking around in there like they're at the barbecue and not the barbecue? You see, God just works through the natural order of things. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they said prior to going in, and they said prior to going out, listen, we're not going to bow down to your statue because that's not God. We know who God is. God's awesome, and he loves us, and he's for us. And even if he chooses not to rescue us from you, we're not bowing down. And when Nebuchadnezzar saw that, God again revealed his power, his authority, his passion for his people, and it led to people turning to God and people saying, wow. See, God is willing to work in the natural order of events through decisions the governments make to reveal his power, his plans, and his purpose. Just a couple weeks ago, our own president made a really bold and gutsy decision. Now, whether you agree with it or not, he said, you know what? I'm going to acknowledge that Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. Now listen, I don't know what that means. But here's what I do know. Five years from now, 20 years from now, I don't know when Jesus is coming back, so I'm just going to keep going out. 20 years from now, I just know he is coming back. 50 years from now, I bet God's in the details of that decision. I bet we'll be able with hindsight to be able to trace some things back to God accomplishing his will and his plans back to a decision that a president made. I bet we'll be able to see it. And God doesn't just work like through big things like that. He works in the tiny details of our lives as well. If you were to reflect on your own life, I bet you would have stories where you could say, oh, God protected me from. Oh, God brought me to. You see, God's always in the details of life. He's never not working. He's always working for his glory and for the good of those who love him. And he's willing to work through the natural order of events, through the natural order of decisions being made to accomplish his plans and his purposes. And he was willing to do it then. He's willing to do it now. And this is just a really long way of saying he got Mary and Joseph to Bethlehem using the census. All morning long, I've been harping on God is, on, God is in the details. Listen, even the details surrounding Bethlehem. This is so fascinating. This is so fun. This is so awesome. Even the details around Bethlehem point to the purpose for which Jesus came. Because you see, back in Jesus' day, there was these, this group of people known as shepherds. Now, most of the shepherds were doing their shepherding out in the wilderness, which was about 90 miles away from Jerusalem. But in Jerusalem was this epicenter of worship. It's where the temple was. It's where people from all over Israel would come to be in the presence of God. It was as close as they could get. And what they would do is they would offer lambs as sacrifices for their sins. Well, there are so many people coming and they don't have pickup trucks and they don't have semi trucks and they don't have trains to take the sheep from all out in the wilderness up to the temple. So they need a place that is closer, that they can just, a place close in proximity where there are sheep that they can readily go get, that there are baby lambs that they can readily go get and offer as, as sin offerings in the temple. Does anybody want to dare guess where that place was that they raised sheep? to be born for sin offerings? Anybody want to take a stab at it? Bethlehem. The very place that Jesus Christ was born is the very place that, they, that sheep were born and raised for the purpose of being sin offerings. The place where Jesus first appeared in flesh and blood is the very place that points to the purpose for which he came. What is one of the many names Jesus is referred to? The Lamb of of kids get it it's awesome way to go mom dad way to go grandma grandpa i'm just telling you listen even the details in the name bethlehem even the details in the place bethlehem point to the purpose for which god came god's in the details 
And he's revealing himself. He's revealing the mystery of Jesus. Even in the very place Jesus was born. It just makes my mind go, this is awesome. You probably heard it explode a couple weeks ago. You just didn't know it was my brain. (laughs) Even the name Bethlehem is awesome. Even the name Bethlehem points to the purpose for which Jesus came. Even the name Bethlehem is a detail that God is in. You see, Bethlehem is actually two words. Bethel means house of. Lehem means bread. But Bethlehem also has another name because we already read it in Micah 2, Micah 5, 2. It's Bethlehem Ephratah. From the name Ephratah, if that, the root word of that is peri, which comes for wine. On the night that Jesus Christ was betrayed, he took the what? The bread and the, and he gave thanks. You see, the name Bethlehem reveals the symbols that Jesus used, the place that he first appeared in flesh and blood. The name bears the symbols that Jesus used, the purpose for which he came which was to shed his blood and his body would be broken for us. So let me put this thing, all thing together. It's important detail. God loves us so much, not because we're so good, but because he's so good. He loves us so much that he gave his one and only son, Jesus, who came to pay the price for our sins so that we could know him. Lord, the only words I have to say is thank you. Thank you for Christmas. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus, so that we could have life, we live in freedom, and we can know you. God, you are awesome. To you alone, all glory, praise, and honor be. In Jesus' name, amen.